the days after Pentecost to now bring forth the Lord's precepts, commandments and instructions on how sanctity is to be obtained. Because now that the Holy Spirit has been given, the church begins to commemorate the saints. Not that it hasn't commemorated them during the fasting period. It has, but indeed now the emphasis is more and more on this. There are people in the whole world, not many, but in various locations, whose job it is to search out saints who, who have been, whose names have been lost or neglected, and to write these back into the church calendar so that they can be commemorated. For example, <clears throat> the St. Herman calendar that we use here, when it first began several decades ago, was a very thin little book. Today it has, I think, some 20,000 saints written in there. Not every one of the saints is in that book because there's obviously millions of them, not just a few thousand. <clears throat> but over the centuries, these sort of documents about the saints have been either lost or even destroyed. And it is certainly a godly work to try and find these names, find these lives, and bring them forth for us, for our, all our identification. If you think about it, the holy places where these names have always been kept, for example, on Mount Athos, how many times, how many times both Muslims, Saracens, have attacked that place, killed, destroyed and burned, as well as the Papists, who believe in that they have the truth, after they broke away from the, tr the truth, also attacked that holy mountain, killing the monks, murdering them, torturing them, setting fire to the wonderful books and materials that they have there. So it is certainly a big job <clears throat> to find these saints again. One thing that I am very happy about is that there is in some places an emphasis on finding the saints that are from the western lands. Like for example St. Patrick whom we have here who I was very pleased to find in an op shop. As you can see, St. Patrick, an Orthodox saint, when he came to the land of Ireland to spread Orthodoxy, the first thing he did was banish all the snakes. And Ireland is now a country where there are no snakes. And by snakes it means not just those things that crawl on the earth, but the snakes that are the spirits of the evil one who try to uh, entice men into the wrong areas. Even though the Papist commemorates St. Patrick, it's very funny that he was an Orthodox saint, not a Papist saint. <clears throat> and there are many like that. As our Lord said, they gave up Houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands for his name and went and got eternal life. Because all these other things are temporary and passing away and even though we do need these for the propagation of the human race and the um, filling of sanctity on the earth, the most important thing is to inherit this eternal life by putting nothing, nothing above the following of Christ. Some people often have trouble with that saying that he who loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And one who loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
So we already have that hierarchy that I often tell you about in the scheme of things. Because it can be quite confusing for young people today who might get married or something like this and have children and are torn apart in the family because the hierarchy is mixed up. Christ is at the top. If you are married, it's the spouse next. Then it's the children. Then it's the extended family, grandparents, whatever. Cousins, uncles, and um, you know various colleagues that you might know and friends, your neighbours, and all those who may not even be orthodox. But that is the hierarchy. Christ has to be on the very top of those actions that we do in our life. <coughs> the acquisition of this sanctity is certainly a very difficult work even by saying these sorts of things. It sounds harsh, <coughs> excuse my voice today, but it does work. And there is love in the family when this happens. When Christ is put first for the whole family, very soon everything falls into place. The world is right now, and it has for many a time, spoken about this particular love and peace that they, they try to acquire. I believe there's going to be a big meeting in Moscow very shortly about peace, peace for the world. From various places people are going to meet and they're going to talk about peace. In the Orthodox Church we separate peace, two types. One we call shalom, a Hebrew word. The other one we call irini, which is the Holy One. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, peace I give unto you, my peace I give unto you, not like the world gives, but like I give unto you. So obviously the peace that the world gives is different to the peace that Christ gives. One is, sh is shalom, the Jewish word. The other one is irini, which is that peace that occurs, first of all, in a person's disposition. And if it occurs in a person's disposition, then, like a candle, it can ignite the peace of everybody else. Shalom is the peace that people use when they wear a mask. They say that, but inside they are full of hate. Hate for those to whom they have that communication. And that's why the wars continue, and all the terrors in the world continue, and the suffering continues. You will see that when they have this meeting in Moscow, just like they've had in many, many other countries before, what peace arose out of that? None. They all said, yes, yes, peace, 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 all over the place. And when they go away, there's a new war, there's a new explosion, there's a new... Um, Suffering somewhere or other, and it's certainly not the peace that Christ brought to us. <clears throat> if it was the peace that Christ brought to us, then they would start it with prayer, and they would talk about how do we change our internal being so that we are not fake to everybody else, and so that the peace that we talk about is truly a peace where... We are honest with everybody else and we begin to love everybody else and not have this fakeness. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. It's almost become 
well, it has become a laughing matter. All these meetings which are a good excuse for no, 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 no. politicians and others to get free travel around the world, to sit around with yeah. leaders, be photographed with them, and to promote themselves so that they can win the next election or whatever their reasons might be for that. <clears throat> but what peace do they bring back to us? None. None at all. And the way the world is structured today, because, Christ, because Christianity has been rejected, they can't have this peace anyway. It's impossible. Because that peace can only exist to those who have indeed been baptised and chrismated into the true church. By that, by that, baptism and chrismation, the satanic forces that live in them and influence them are expelled and no longer keep them in subjection and direction as long as they don't allow it. But the other ones that gather for these peace meetings, many of them worship elephants, and you see their processions, different sort of beasts of various kinds, many worship special trees, because they have these branches going out and they um, burn incense before these trees and venerate them and kiss them. <coughs> I saw a documentary where an Englishman happened to be amongst one of these tribes and they had a fire inside their tent and one of the logs of the fire happened to roll off. So this Englishman came back and he sort of kicked it back into the fire and the whole community there was in uproar. They said, what are you doing? You've insulted the fire. You've insulted. This is a holy thing and you have insulted the fire. The only way you can put it back is by picking it up, venerating it and putting it back. That's the level that we're on today in the world. All over the place. All over the place. Elephants with um, chrysanthemums, rats and mice, snakes, fires, trees, all these sorts of things are worshipped, even by rational scientists, even by that. They, they believe that out of the chemicals of the earth, life arises somehow. And when you ask them, what is the essence that gives life? What is it? Or it's the chemicals or something. You can mix those chemicals for millions of years and you will never get them to actually live. Because the essence of life exists. It exists from God. And that's the only way that you can obtain that. By the teaching that I do, I can see that our children are also um, plagued by this in the schools that they go to. Because the alternative, the way of life and the things that God gives us are never ever part of their scientific training. God is not in the equation at all. Not at all. And the questions that they have to answer and all these sorts of things. For example, only this week for grade 7 and 8 <clears throat> in science, there was a lesson about anger management. Anger management. Right. How to manage your anger. 
I so looked at that book and I so dissected it and at no point did it have one little indication on where anger arises. But then it had a whole lot of things about how to ma manage your anger. Walk away, stop, have a think, you know, um, say something nice, whatever. <clears throat> but the crux of it, where does the anger arise? Nothing. Nothing at all. We know that anger is a passion which is a part of the fallen nature of man. And we are supposed to root that out of ourselves. And that's not an easy task, because it's the precursor of hate in, very, in various forms. They are the sorts of things that these leaders are supposed to be talking about, but they never do. If you're ang angry, go and see a psychiatrist <clears throat> who is going to give you anger management strategies. doesn't fix you up. It's like a pill which you take when, you're, when you have a headache. You might have a very serious sickness and that's why you have a headache. And a pill's not going to take, not going to do anything about it. But what you need is an operation, um, a painful one, and a long one, to root that out. It's the same with spiritual life. To root out the passions that live in us, the Holy Fathers say, are a difficult, painful process. So don't kid yourself. <clears throat> That's why people like St. John Chrysostom and others are begging us to read the lives of the saints, read the lives about spiritual life, and pray so that those sorts of things that live in us, that cause us all these wrong things, may be put to rest and true peace in here can actually reign in us. This week we are commemorating Holy Archbishop John, who reposed. A saint who touched our little mission, and we have a little bit of his mantia there in the icon. And indeed, he was one that taught people this spiritual life. There was a big community in San Francisco where he lived. And like all those sorts of communities, they like to raise money, balls, you know, um, what do they call them, pirashki, and all those sorts of things. And on Saturday evening, they had a massive ball in the hall. Lots of dancing and drinking and eating and whatever, whilst Archbishop John was celebrating the... Um, <clears throat> matins and vespers for liturgy. When he finished, he went to this hall and everybody stopped. He didn't say a word. He just walked around and looked at them all and, and walked out. And the next day there was a massive queue of people for confession that went right around the churches outside because they got the point. They got the point on what it's all about. That you can't obtain holiness by that sort of life. I urge you all to pray to him because he's one of those saints of our times whose life we know in a lot of detail and whose the people that knew him are still alive and can tell you many great things about what he did. And he's commemorated <clears throat> this coming week. Like all the saints, I tell you again, make sure you have your saint and you know the life of your saint and the life of the, ch the, the children that have their saints and that they know them, have icons of them and pray to them 
and ask them for help. And then that irini, that true peace that we can see, will indeed come to us like a candle igniting all.